Hi, welcome to CMC. I'm Kermit Whitfield, member of the CMC Board of Trustees and Director of Communications at United Way of Central Ohio. Today, the Columbus Metropolitan Club is pleased to present Susan Herman, brought to us with support from Puffin Foundation West, Columbus Business First, and Taft, and in partnership with American Civil Liberties Union of Ohio. A big round of applause for our sponsors and partner. <laughs> The ACLU was founded in 1920 to ensure the promise of the Bill of Rights and to expand its reach to people historically denied its protections. For nearly 100 years, the ACLU has been our nation's garden of guardian of liberty, defending the individual rights that the Constitution and the laws of the United States guarantee everyone in our country. And in 2017, the ACLU has never been busier. Please welcome President of the American Civil Liberties Union, Susan Herman. <laughs> Colleen Marshall, uh, anchor at NBC4 and um, attorney at Masucci Law. And Susan will begin with some opening remarks and then have a conversation with Colleen. Susan, the podium is yours. Uh, thank you, Kermit. And thank you all for the invitation to be here with you today, which I really appreciate. So I want to start by telling you that last month I spoke at another very nice lunch of an executives club in a city that I will not mention, because the organizers, uh, very unlike the organizers here today, tried to censor my PowerPoint. Shock, you know. Is this ironic? Now, number one, yeah, how do you invite the president of the ACLU and try to censor her speech? Right? <laughs> I figured out that what they were all about was that they had a club. In their club, they had people who were of many different political stripes, and they had their pro-Trump and their anti-Trump people. And one of the slides that I had in my PowerPoint had pictures of pro-Trump and anti-Trump buttons, and a couple of other slides that just made them nervous. And I figured out that what they were nervous about was they, they wanted to provide their club as a safe space that was a politics-free zone. And they were worried that I might be divisive. Now, why is this ironic? Well, first of all, uh, the ACLU is nonpartisan, and it is, uh, of course, true that we oppose many of President Trump's policies, but then I think we have actually sued every president since 1920 when we were founded. So, you know, nothing personal. We don't support or oppose any candidates, so I was not about to start, you know, bashing Trump and, you know, making anything personal. Second of all, the ACLU is content neutral, and we are perfectly willing and able to support the rights of people who speak on behalf of Trump just as much as the people who speak against Trump. You may know that the ACLU of Ohio, represented today, brought a wonderful lawsuit before the Republican National Convention came to Cleveland, and the Cleveland police wanted to have a very large event zone where people wouldn't be allowed to demonstrate. So the ACLU of Ohio successfully argued that that was going to violate the First Amendment, and I understand it was the brilliant legal director, Freda, who decided to name the lawsuit after one of the plaintiffs in the case. The people objecting were included in an Ohio homelessness group that wanted to demonstrate at the um, convention. But the lead plaintiff was called Citizens for Trump. We defend their right to speak, too. Now, finally, the reason that I thought it was very ironic that they were afraid that I was going to be divisive was that one of the chief points that I wanted to make is that I think that what we need today in our country is more speech about divisive issues. We need to talk across our political divide. Now, I'm certainly not the first to note that it feels these days like we're the divided states of America. And Democrats and Republicans alike, everyone seems to have their worldview and, you know, kind of Ir, you know, ir, you know, they think what they think, and not only do they have their own viewpoint, but they seem to have their own facts. And I think that people are finding these divisions uncomfortable, and that is tending to make people retreat more and more into their own echo chambers. How many people do you know who watch MSNBC or Fox News, right? How many people do you know, do know who might watch both? When's the last time you had a good conversation with somebody who you thought was really going to disagree with you about your political views and your views about Trump? I think people are tending to avoid. We're silencing ourselves. We're censoring ourselves so that we don't have unpleasant confrontations because we expect to disagree. Now, what I find especially alarming is that I think that this silence is also tending to creep toward not just silencing ourselves, but to being silenced. Um, there are too many students on too many campuses who don't want to hear from speakers of the opposing point of view. So we hear in the news about students at predominantly left-wing universities who are excluding or um, out-shouting 
speakers who are conservative, and we hear vice versa at new predominantly right-wing schools where the students don't want to hear from students who express points of view that they disagree with. There are in 30 states around this country at present, there are legislatures entertaining bills to seriously punish different forms of protest. Most of these have not passed, and I hope they won't. But the fact that legislatures are even thinking about such things, I think, is truly alarming. Let me give you some examples. Uh, there is a, a bill pending in Arizona, I think it is, that says that if you are involved in organizing a protest and violence breaks out at that protest, you can be subject to asset forfeiture. You could perhaps lose your home, even if you weren't involved in the violence and even if you didn't know that somebody else would do that. Now, is that going to chill people? If that were passed, would that chill people from getting involved in demonstrations? You bet. In North Carolina, there is a bill pending that would make it the crime of economic terrorism to block a sidewalk during a demonstration. In South Dakota, they're proposing to make it not a crime if you run over a protester with your car because they were in your way. Okay, so all these, you know, this um, antipathy to dissent, to, you know, wanting to silence people, I think is really frightening. And it's not only about the idea that maybe dissent is unpleasant, but we also have a president who at this point is referring to the media as enemies if in fact they say things that are critical of what he thinks. So I have a solution to propose, and my solution is more First Amendment. As Kermit was just saying, the ACLU was founded in 1920, and one of the chief things that was going on at the time that inspired the foundation of the ACLU by a very unlikely coalition of people who had worked in the suffrage movement and the labor movement and who were conscientious objectors was that the government at the time during World War I was prosecuting people for speech, unpatriotic speech. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but people were convicted of crimes during World War I and right around that time for speaking out against the war, for speaking out against the draft, for speaking out against the form of government. Now, this was something that was very upsetting to the people who founded the ACLU, who wanted their right to say things that were unpopular and to have demonstrations and to dissent. Roger Baldwin, who was one of the founders and first executive directors, used to be very fond of reading out the text of the First Amendment at a public demonstration, and then he would be arrested for reading the First Amendment. <laughs> so the idea was, you know, something had to be done. Now, Today, we're used to the concept of the First Amendment as protecting dissenting points of view, but that is not something that was always you know, true through the history of the country. And the, um, the, during, World War I was not the first time that American administrations, presidential administrations, had come down on opponents, you political opponents. I think you can trace some of that back to John Adams, who in 1798, with his Federalist Congress, passed the um, Alien and Sedition Acts, the Sedition Act was uh, to punish, it was so vaguely worded that it could be used by the Federalist, President, Congress, and prosecutors, as well as the judges, who were all you know, mostly Federalists at that time, to prosecute Republicans who were critical of the Federalists. So they were prosecuting the media, and there was no court that stood up to it because the courts were also Federalist. Now, obviously, the Sedition Acts were controversial. But the idea that you could get a court to say, you can't prosecute people for saying something that people don't like because they're protected by the First Amendment, that is a principle that we know today because during the 20th century, litigation, mostly by the ACLU and other groups, convinced the courts that they needed to say that. So between World War I, where people were prosecuted for you know, criticizing the draft, and World War II, there was a tremendous change in the Supreme Court's understanding of the First Amendment to the point where in the middle of World War II, the Supreme Court decided a remarkable case called West Virginia versus Barnett, where the Supreme Court held that two little girls in West Virginia, who were Jehovah's Witnesses, had a right under the First Amendment to decline to salute the flag in the middle of World War II in West Virginia. Just because their neighbors didn't like what they were doing didn't mean that they could be compelled to, to salute the flag. What West Virginia had done was the girls were not allowed to go to school if they didn't salute the flag. So West Virginia was then coming after their parents to prosecute them because their children weren't attending school. So, you know, tremendous change in our understanding of the First Amendment. And I think that if you ask people in this country, I think you would find a lot of agreement with the idea that we do have free speech here and that the First Amendment means not only that there's protection for dissenting points of view, but that we're committed to the principle that reasonable people can and do differ about their ideas and their viewpoints, just as they differ about their religions. Unlike China, 
where I understand there's uh, the understanding is that there are correct and incorrect ideas. We don't have correct and incorrect ideas. We have your ideas and my ideas. Um, as I say, I think that if you, you really talked to people about this, I think you would find that there is a common agreement that we do understand this principle, although you know, maybe we can talk more later during the Q&A about some places where I'm concerned that not everyone seems to fully understand that. Now, the second impetus for the founding of the ACLU was the xenophobia present around the time of World War I, fear of foreigners, scapegoating of people who were considered to be different. So um, I'm finding that, how many people have heard of the Palmer Raids? Okay, that's what I'm finding. You know, most people have not, most people have not studied this in school. It's one of the incidents that we're not that proud of in our history. But in 1919 and 1920, the um, terrorists of the day were anarchists. And some anarchists planted a bomb pretty near the home of Attorney General Mitchell Palmer. So Mitchell Palmer reacted, of course, by rounding up about 6,000 people and arresting people with absolutely no reason to suspect individual people and deported about 500 people. People were kept under terrible conditions. They were interrogated. It was scapegoating. It was a dragnet. And the people who were affected were mostly Eastern Europeans. Anybody who was believed to have any sort of connection with Russia, with communism, that was what the enemy at the time. Italians were also really suspect because there were some Italian anarchists. So this whole idea that if we're afraid, the appropriate thing to do is lay out a dragnet and take everybody who looks like the people we're afraid of and you know, get rid of them, lock them up, keep them out of the country, was something that at the time the country thought was appropriate. The Washington Post at the time editorialized, this is no time for constitutional hair splitting. This is an emergency. You have to be safe, better safe than sorry. Well, the first thing that the ACLU did after being founded was to write a report on the Palmer Raids. And gradually, there was a federal judge involved who um, heard some of the cases involved and granted habeas corpus petitions to some of the people who had been detained. And after not too long, actually, the American public changed its mind about whether or not this was a good strategy for dealing with the problem of anarchists. But you'll note that, again, there are a lot of roots to this whole idea in American history. That's not the only occasion on which people have been scapegoated. There were, um, starting again with the Alien and Sedition Acts, the Alien Act of 1798 was, deemed, was um, targeted at the enemy at, at the time. And it gave the president discretion to remove people from the country who were dangerous because they were French. And France was our quasi-enemy, and said, therefore anybody who was French was suspect. We've had the Chinese Exclusion Acts. We had World War II. We had the evacuation and internment of tens of thousands of loyal Japanese Americans. So it's something that is a thread throughout time. When we become afraid, we forget about our principle of liberty and justice for all, and we start dragnetting people. We're always sorry afterwards. Well, here's what I find very encouraging today, is that there are a lot of people who are really standing up to the idea that we should be scapegoating and dragnetting. So I'm sure you know that when the, the, uh, President Trump's travel ban first became effective on January 27th, people around the country started spontaneously showing up at airports by the hundreds just to support people, to say, this is not who we are. In the litigation that the ACLU has been involved with, as well as a number of states, as well as a number of groups, there's been some extremely interesting support. Um, in the Washington state lawsuit against the travel ban where there was an injunction issued, one of the amicus briefs that was filed was filed by the Korematsu Foundation. Now, Fred Korematsu, who was the person who challenged the Japanese exclusion orders during World War II, is no longer alive, but his daughter Karen is. And I was actually given an award at a dinner of the Japanese American Bar Association because all 600 of the people there wanted to say, what can we do to make sure that it doesn't happen again? What can we do to make sure that Muslim Americans are not treated the way the Japanese Americans were? The case that President Trump is trying to take to the Supreme Court in the Fourth Circuit, also enjoining the travel ban, was a case that um, it began in Maryland. It's an ACLU case. And the chief plaintiff, the name plaintiff, is the International Refugee Assistance Project. The second name plaintiff is a group called HIAS, H-I-A-S. Anyone know what that stands for? The Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. The CEO wrote a wonderful blog for the ACLU saying he decided to get involved in this lawsuit. 
even though their organization has never been involved in any lawsuit before, any litigation, because, he said, how can we sit by and watch what's happening to Syrian refugees, which seems the same as what happened to Jews during the 1930s, and not intervene? So they decided that they were going to take action. They were founded in 1881 to help refugees from the pogroms in Russia and other places to resettle in the United States. So there you have the Japanese Americans, the Jewish Americans. There have been hundreds of Christian evangelists, churches and individuals who have signed petitions and written letters saying this is not Christian, this is not a way to act. And I'll tell you another one of the slides that that other executives club wanted to censor. I had a slide that was the cover of an amicus brief that was filed by a number of businesses, also in the Washington state case, opposing the travel ban. It's a very impressive list of like 100 different corporations from Apple to Zygma. And I had a slide showing the names of the corporations and they said, could you please not show that? We don't want to annoy anybody. So it's not only people standing up as individuals or in groups, but people standing up through their businesses. And we've seen how much power business has. You know, we've seen the power of business you know, standing up to what was happening in North Carolina, the basketball. You know, there are a lot of uh, components of this country are really standing up. So another thing that has changed a lot since the travel ban and since the elections are that ACLU membership has quadrupled. We are now at over 1.6 million members of people who want to help, people who want to do something. And I'm very proud that the ACLU, at the age of 97, is leading the fight to retain our fundamental values. But I want to tell you that we can't do it without you. So if you want to become a member of the ACLU, that's great. But even if you don't, what I'm going to ask you to do is to start using the First Amendment more and start talking more. Think hard about what are your fundamental values. What do you believe? about what makes this country great. I gave a speech a number of years ago at the US Army War College to an extremely politically diverse group. And afterwards, a lieutenant colonel came up to me and he said, nice pitch. He said, before you spoke, I was determined to disagree with everything you said. <laughs> I said, but then you said, and then I got to thinking, well, wait a minute. If I can tell somebody else what not to say, maybe they could tell me what not to say. And then I'm starting to think, wait a minute, what do I think? And they said, you know, that just sounds right to me. So I think that if you talk with people, you can be surprised. I think we do have some fundamental agreements about what our principles are. I think what's hard, once you think through what your own beliefs are, is to think how to start a conversation with someone you expect to disagree with you without just turning them off immediately. You don't just challenge them and say, you're wrong, and here's why you're wrong. We have to think about how to start these conversations, because I think there's a tremendous amount at stake here. I think we can't, we can't go down this path of isolating ourselves, silencing ourselves, and censoring dissent because it's unpleasant. That's really dangerous. I mean, that's the way to, you know, to a totalitarian state. And we can't go down the path of demonizing people because of their ethnicity or religion, because that's the way to the internments of, of World War II. So what I want to say to you today, my chief message, which is a very simple one, it's not only about the First Amendment, it's about the Constitution. On Inauguration Day, one of the things that the ACLU promoted was a campaign called the People's Oath, where we invited people to take their own oath to support and defend the Constitution, and then to say in a sentence, why? What are the values that are important to you about the Constitution? If you're interested, you can look at the website, and there are you know, 100,000 people taking the oath and saying what they think. But I'm going to ask all of you to take personal ownership of the Constitution, because the Constitution is ours. It belongs to we, the people, and it is worth fighting for. So thank you. Well, there's so much going on these days that involves the ACLU. I thought it was interesting when you mentioned the dragnet and the way uh, American citizens were swept up in the past. When you uh, juxtapose that to the travel ban as it has been proposed and as it has been revised and as it has been renamed, how is the ACLU looking today on the law that's right now before the Supreme Court? Well, the, law, the, the Supreme Court is considering whether or not to take the case, and we have actually until the 12th or 13th in next week right. to, to file the papers. So we'll see whether or not the court takes the case. I think it's probably pretty likely that they will. Uh, you know, to me, this really is just another dragnet, because there's no particular reason to think that people from the six countries that are named are any more dangerous than anybody else. Uh, 
In fact, there have been recent Department of Homeland Security's re security reports suggesting that it is not immigrants who tend to commit acts of terrorism. It's people who are already in the United States. So the connection between national security and the president's travel ban, which he's now again calling a travel ban, which it is. <laughs> it depends uh, on what Twitter day it is. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> depends what time of night. So the, the connection there is a, <laughs> extremely tenuous. And I think that what we are arguing, the argument that persuaded the Fourth Circuit, is that one thing that's wrong with the travel ban constitutionally is that it's a violation of the Establishment Clause. Part of the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause says, the government is not allowed to prefer one religion to another. So the idea of having an order, an executive order that says we're going to you know, have special restrictions on people from Muslim majority countries, if that was the intent, if that was the purpose of the order, to restrict people on the basis of their religion, that's unconstitutional. And the big argument that the, the government is arguing, oh well, nobody should pay any attention to what Trump said because he was pre before he was president, because what does that matter? Well, it does matter. The original travel ban had a religious difference right on the face of it, about you know, Christians and, and non-Christians. The second version has been somewhat laundered, as President Trump has recently told us. It was only the lawyers who were trying to make it sanitary for, for the courts. But it's still motivated by the same desire to keep Muslims out of the country. And therefore, I think the president's comments, and whenever he made them, are extremely relevant under First Amendment law to the question of what the purpose of this law was. And what his intent is. And his be, intent, right. His intent. If the intent yeah. of the law is to discriminate against Muslims, that's a problem under the First Amendment. You know, I found it fascinating. I, I listened to NPR a lot on my way home from work at, mi at midnight. And uh, after the London bombings, and the most recent attack over the weekend, a number of people came forward in London and said, we warned the police about these particular terrorists who were responsible for the stabbing incident over the weekend in London. They said, we knew they were saying things that, you know, they were clearly radical Islam, they were making public statements, they were talking in the park. And I, I thought about that and I thought, People make statements all the time. Are we to be the thought police, the, the, the speech police? Doesn't that seem to go, if that were this country, doesn't that go against what we believe about our free speech rights? But at the same time, we have security issues to address. So how does the ACLU balance security against speech? Well, I think the way we balance that is that under classic First Amendment law, you do have the right to speak. If you want to say, you know, I think Al-Qaeda was great, you can say that. And you cannot be punished for saying that if you're just expressing a viewpoint. The line on the First Amendment is if you incite, if you're trying to incite people to some sort of conduct. So American law does not allow people to be prosecuted for terrorist acts on the basis of what they say. There is one unfortunate Supreme Court case that comes pretty close, I think. But the basic idea is if you're just expressing your point of view, you can do that. Um, what you can't do is you can't try to incite other people. So I, I think it's a problem. But I think in a reaction to you know, what, what's been happening in the UK, one of the big questions right now is what they're going to do in response. And one of the things that you're suggesting is that maybe they'll you know, kind of have a, a tighter net and try to look at people earlier and arrest them for different kinds of crimes. And one thing that I think is that, which I think we've learned since 9-11 in particular, is that right after a terrorist attack is probably the worst time to make a drastic change in your policy. Because the psychologists tell us that fear, the part of your brain that's affected by fear, can really outshout the rational part of your brain. And you're going to do things that don't actually make sense if you're acting under the impetus of fear. I actually wrote a book about this after 9-11, about the ways in which the, our changes in the law have affected ordinary Americans. And a lot of them were kind of you know, reactions from the panicky days following the attacks, which in retrospect, if we looked at them carefully, a lot of them really don't make sense. You know, it's like, you know, too much cost to our constitutional rights with not enough showing of any possible benefits. You know, you, you've talked about um, you know, the free speech and people being more involved and, and asserting their First Amendment rights and, and, and saying what they believe and acting on their beliefs. We saw uh, two weekends ago, a number of students, dozens of students, got up and walked out because Betsy DeVos was invited to be the graduation speaker. Certainly that's their right to get up and, and walk out. Uh, should, from your, from your perspective, would you have rather had them hear from someone who they disagree with 
or assert their right to get up and walk away? Well, my perspective is that should be their choice. I mean, if they want to, you know, I think there are certain limits of, you know, you can't outshout a speaker, you know, that you can't do. But I think that one thing that we've been seeing around campuses is that you know, this whole, you know, kind of fear of opposing point of views. So I'll tell you, there was a study done by UCLA a few years ago where they did a survey of 140,000 incoming freshmen at schools, you know, all over. And they surveyed them about their attitudes about a number of things, including about, you know, free speech. And what was interesting to me were two answers. One thing that the students answered, a super majority said, we think dissent is really important and should be preserved and protected. We really believe in demonstrations. We believe people have the right to dissent. A similar number, another super majority, also said that they thought that their schools should protect them against speech that they didn't want to hear, <laughs> that they should have safe spaces. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, another name for dissent is things that people don't want to hear. So <laughs> I feel like you know, we have a lot of work to do on campus to you know, educate students, and I think schools have a, have a lot of work to do. Schools should not be telling students what they can say or can't say. And I think that if you know, people want to picket Betsy DeVos or walk out of her speech, I think schools should not be punishing them for doing that. But I think schools also have a very important role in education. So we hear a lot about students saying, well, I have a right to make a racist joke or say something that people find offensive. And yeah, they do, as long as they haven't crossed the line into harassment or bullying or something like that. But that doesn't mean they should. It doesn't mean it's a good idea to say things that hurt people's feelings and make them feel excluded. So in a way, the ACLU is on both sides of those issues. We fully support anti-bullying measures, and we also support free speech. And we think it's appropriate for schools to be trying to educate people. I, I've heard someone say to you that the ACLU has never been busier than you are <laughs> right now. Uh, those of us who grew up in the 60s remember student demonstrations. I was a kid in the 60s, by the way. <laughs> but I remember it. But we do remember that decade of, of turmoil and unrest and, and civil discourse. And you know the Equal Rights Amendment was emerging at that time. Yeah. And certainly the Civil Rights Movement was emerging at the time. And the anti-war movement and there was a lot of public discourse at that time. Wasn't that maybe the busiest decade for all of us? Or how does that compare to what you're dealing with today? Well, you know, in some ways, we've always been busy. Uh, <laughs> and Roger Baldwin, who was the first executive director who I mentioned before, he who liked to read out the First Amendment because it was so controversial, one thing that he said that I think is very true is he said, no civil liberties battle ever remains won. So you look at the free speech movement in Berkeley and you think, okay, and I've been there, done that, we've won that battle. And it turns out, you know, it's come around again. Roe v. Wade, oh, that's been decided, we don't have to worry. Okay, how many laws have been pending in Ohio saying, yeah. let's chip, 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 let's decimate, let's get out the, the hammer. And you, voting rights, the Voting Rights Act passed, it was a bipartisan act, it was enormously popular. Now voting rights are really under threat all around the country, with all sorts of you know, states trying to do things to suppress votes in, in many different ways. So I think that whole idea that you know, no civil liberties battle ever remains won is unfortunately all too true. Yeah, it really is. And I, I want to remind all of you that you can uh, exercise your free speech, because in just a minute we're going to take a couple of questions. If you've got them, if you want to line up to the microphone over there, uh, we do like to have our audience stand up and ask the questions of our speakers. But. Um, as I listen to you and, and all the turmoil and what's, you know, the battles that you are still fighting and those that are re-emerging and recycling, are you optimistic about where we are going as a nation? Uh, we were also talking at the table about um, our kids seem to have really different attitudes about uh, homosexuality, about transgender mm -hmm. classmates, it's not a big deal. Um, are you optimistic about what's next for us? Well, you know, I do have a lot of faith in the American people. And what we were just saying was that all the, you know, the homophobia that you, many of us know entirely too much about, the sort of jack you say transgender and some people will just get up in arms. We were saying that that's going to age out. The younger generations don't have a problem with people marrying who they love or, you know, et cetera. So I think I have a, a great deal of faith in that. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing I want to say is, despite Roger Baldwin's admonition that no civil liberties battle remains won, I think that one will remain won. I think we've won marriage equality, and we've won a great deal of acceptance for people you know, who seem different. And that, that one, I think we've definitely made progress. Now, I think what's alarming is that despite what a majority of people in the country want, is I think we're in a very dangerous time, where if, in fact, you shut down the channels of dissent and the channels of opposition, we could really end up with a very different America. So I think it's, it's hard to predict, and I think that's why I'm urging all of us and everybody you know 
to you know, be on the case. You know, this is your constitution. You can't just sit back and assume that everything's going to be all right. I think we have to be active you know, in, in our democracy here. Um, yeah, I, I think it's hard to say. I think the, the First Amendment, is, is, it's a good structure, but I think we do have to work to preserve it. You know, I, from my perspective, as someone who works in the media uh, and is being called by the President of the United States, fake news and, and the enemy of the people, I have noticed that more than ever before, the, if we report factually a story, each side sees that same exact story in very different ways. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's words on a paper, and I'm saying the same thing that every, everybody's hearing the same thing, but they really key in in a different way. And is that a trend you're seeing around the country, that this divided, this divided nation, this divided conversation that we're having, people are trying to line up with people who agree with them and talk and hear from the people who say what they want to hear? Yeah. I think it's true that we really have become, you know, hyper-partisan in a way, and people are really identifying. It feels to me almost tribal. It's like people identify as Democrats or as Republicans, and it's very hard to engage and get them to, you know, express any doubt. But to me, it, it's not so much a trend as I think it's very good that we've had the discovery of how the psychology of all this works. We know a lot more than we used to about implicit bias. It's, you know, the Supreme Court says racism was when you purposely, blitheringly you know, arrest somebody because they're a different race. Well, you know, that's not what, so much what happens anymore, but there's a lot of implicit bias. You know, people make assumptions about people of certain races, and they don't intend to be racist, but they are you know, in, in, in practical terms. And I think it's the same in terms of you know, we've seen a lot of evidence that, as you're saying, people can look at the same story, and you know, the Democrats will see it this way, and the Republicans will see it that way. So I think it's good that we've discovered this truth, and we've discovered how it is that people end up with different impressions, not only about what their views are, but what the facts are. And I think the real challenge for us now is what to do about that. So the ACLU's First Amendment motto is the antidote to bad speech is more speech. And that's why I think it's up to all of us to try to figure out how do you start that conversation with the uncle who you avoided talking to at Thanksgiving because you knew he was <laughs> going to disagree with you. How do you figure out what values in, you have in common? And how do you deal with the fact that they see you know, black and you see white, that they see A and you see B? And I think you know, getting beyond that, I think, is really our next challenge. How do we become the, the more perfect union? Well, we are going to take some questions now. If you can, I will remind you that um, it is our tradition to ask the audience to, for questions, but state your name, ask your question, and we thank you in advance for not making a long editorial remark. <laughs> so our first question, please. My name is Ro Rochelle Steinberg, and I would appreciate if you could explain to us why the ACLU supported and s continues to support Citizens United. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, what I was just thinking was I was going to tell you as we were going to questions and answers was that at that other executives club, they had a tablet where the questions were sent to the moderator who then screened the questions to see if they were appropriate. <laughs> and what I want to tell you is again, hey, you know, whatever you know, questions people want to ask, including if you have you know, questions that are hostile or whatever, happy to hear what you have to say. So, Citizens United. So, there are, uh, we actually did not support what the Supreme Court did in Citizens United, but we do believe that the First Amendment prohibits there being limits on campaign speech. We do believe that it's appropriate to have limitations on campaign contributions, but we think that speech is protected by the First Amendment and that you get to speak all you want. Not that we think money is speech, but money does buy opportunities to speak, and for the government to start censoring what people can say and how much different people, we can, people can say, we think the solution would be worse than the problem. So what I can tell you is that the ACLU board has considered this issue no fewer than 17 times because we have a division among our lay leadership, and that's how we make policy. The ACLU board is composed of representatives from all of our 50 affiliates all around the country, plus some more people. And we have very thorough, um, interesting debates about issues when we have to figure out what position we're going to take on different issues. So we've had many debates about this issue, and experts come in, and we've done a lot of reading. And I'm going to generalize for you, because there's certainly two different camps, or more than two, about what the First Amendment means about campaign finance. One is a kind of libertarian view that says the government can't tell you what to say. You get to decide what to say. And that's what the First Amendment protects. It has to be your decision and not the government's limiting your speech. 
The other point of view is a more equality-based view of the First Amendment that says the First Amendment is designed to give us good political discussions, and therefore it's appropriate for the government to be a referee and get, make sure that everybody gets to speak equally. Both points of view have been represented on the ACLU board, and I am very proud that we model democracy. We have full debates and then we take votes, and that is what the majority of ACLU people think. So, to the person who asked the question, I would say, if you don't like the ACLU's current position, I want to quote one of my colleagues who once said, if you agree with the ACLU 80% of the time, you should be a member. If you agree with the ACLU 50% of the time, you should be on the board. <laughs> As a multi-issue organization, we always have places where some people disagree. Although it was a brief follow-up to that. You are, it's right that everyone should be allowed to say what they say. In the, in the instance of campaign speech, that is speech that is for sale. And it is counterintuitive for someone who uh, works at a television station that makes a lot of money. That speech is the more money you have, the more you are speaking. So is that not a conflict in, in your position on Citizens United? Well, I think the main way to solve that conflict is to have more public financing. I think the question of what to do about money and politics, that's a real problem. But we think that the solution of let the government say who can't speak is going to be worse than the problem. Therefore, I think we need to come up with better ways to get more speech. And it had seemed to me that when television advertising, which is very expensive, as you well know, stopped being the main way to communicate with people, and we started having all this access to the internet, it should have been that that problem would get better because it's so easy to communicate with large numbers of people now. You, know, you don't have to buy ads on television. There are all sorts of things you can do to get the word out in ways that are not expensive. But again, I think I would prefer to see solutions that would focus more directly on how do we get more voices in there so that we're not drowned out by the people with the money, which is clearly not desirable. But again, the um, Federal Elections Commission has been, even on, in the Obama years, they've just, we're just stymied. They're bipartisan and they ended up doing nothing. When the campaign finance laws first came into effect, the first people the government went after were the Socialist Workers Party. You know, that they were, they were you know, violating the campaign finance laws. So you know, it's like the fox in the hen house. You really want the government to tell, tell people how much they can speak? Anyway, that's you know, basically we do have, we are uh, uh, an ACLU divided on that issue. <laughs> Carol? My name is Carol Looper. Harvard has recently unadmitted 10 freshmen who they had admitted for the next year. The reason is that they set up a Facebook page, a private Facebook page, a group Facebook page that spoke about racism, that mentioned some words that were sexist, that talked about uh, rape, and said all of these things in very unacceptable ways to Harvard. And Harvard said that in our code, the things that you have said are unacceptable to us, to students at our school. Is the ACLU taking a position on that, or do you have to be, again, on both sides of that? I'm sorry, what was the beginning? What school is this? Harvard. At Harvard, at Harvard. okay. Uh, well, Harvard is a private university. And the First Amendment does not, you know, we don't always agree that, that, that Harvard shouldn't have to follow First Amendment principles, but you can't sue Harvard for violating your First Amendment rights because they're not a governmental actor. And as the lawyers in the room know, that's a you know, distinction under the First Amendment. So there isn't a First Amendment right. Um, I don't know you know whether the ACLU of Massachusetts has looked at that or what the position would be. But to me, Sarah, that really it ties in with what I was talking about about you know trying to draw the lines between what's speech and what's conduct and, and what's acceptable on a campus. I think they're very difficult issues. And you know, given that we have um, uh, our executive director, Anthony Romero, is fond of saying we have three hundred lawyers in the ACLU. And so, yeah, I don't know what all of them are doing, but when he makes the point, uh, what he's uh, usually saying is that the government, the, we have 300 lawyers and the Department of Justice alone has 17,000. So there's a lot going on, and often you know, my view is from 30,000 feet. So I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you, you know, whether uh, affiliates have taken particular positions on those issues. Hi. Good afternoon, my name is Kathy Fox. Um, in Ohio, the Ohio ACLU defended the right of the KKK to demonstrate at our state house and um, notably in one of the um, appearances of the attorney from the ACLU who was defending the KKK, the KKK boss insulted the religion of the, um, the lawyer who was defending them and said, oh, nothing personal to you. It was um, a rather interesting moment. 
I'm wondering when, at what point does speech become incite? Uh, you mentioned that that was a dividing line, that you, can, you have the right to speak, but you don't have the right to incite others. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, okay, is David Goldberger here today? Oh, okay, uh, you may be aware that one of the people who teaches at Ohio State University and who's been on the board of the ACLU of Ohio, David Goldberger, was the attorney for the ACLU of Illinois when they litigated the case about Skokie. And that was the case where the neo-Nazis wanted to march through Skokie, Illinois, which they had selected because it was a town where Holocaust survivors lived and they wanted to do you know, maximum you know, insult. Uh, the ACLU, again, holding our noses, uh, defended the right of the neo-Nazis to have their parade because, again, I think it's very difficult to start saying, well, you can say anything you want, but you can't say that because that's going to hurt people's feelings. And you know, does this hurt people's feelings? Absolutely. We also had to really hold our noses writing an amicus brief in the more recent case of the Westboro Baptist Church. Do you know about that group? Miserable people. They picket military funerals and tell you know, the grieving families that the reason that their child died uh, as a member of the American military was that our army is not sufficiently homophobic and God is punishing us for admitting people who are, you know, are gay into the military. And so, you know, they have to stay somewhat away because of the time, place, and yeah, manner they, restrictions. They've, de they've demonstrated at funerals here. But they demonstrated yeah. funerals here. Yeah, they demonstrated funerals all over. And clearly, they're just trying to get attention for their miserable views. So, you know, with great pain, we had to hold our noses and say they have a right to say it. You know, there are a lot of people, by the way, who think that the ACLU agrees with all these things that we defend. You know, you get it, right? We're not communists. We're not Nazis. We're not Ku Klux Klan members. We just believe that individual people have the right to decide what they want to say. Uh, so anyway, I, I think that the problem is in terms of what counts as incitement. That's often difficult. But in terms of how you deal with the Nazis parading, there was an incident in New York a while ago where the Klan was marching. It was you know, the 47 bedraggled survivors of the Ku Klux Klan marching in Manhattan. You imagine how popular that was. So what happened there was that instead of, you know, saying deny them a parade permit, I think the basic idea there was that the best antidote is more speech. And in fact, 8,000 New Yorkers lined the parade route and held up signs and you know, yelled out about what they thought of these stupid Ku Klux Klan ideas. And that, to me, is the best approach. It, sometimes there are people who go too far. And um, yeah, it, it's hard to define exactly what's harassment or incitement. I was just giving an example of, you know, uh, in terms of campuses, of you know, what crosses the line. So. I think there are a lot of students who are very surprised when I tell them that, in fact, in fact people do have a constitutional right to make their racist jokes. If you know, they want to make a racist joke, it doesn't mean they should. And the school, I think, can counsel them that you know, it's a bad thing to do. But they do have the constitutional right. And the example that I use that's clearly to me on the other side that is harassment was at one school where some jokesters thought it would be very amusing to put a photograph of a lynching on the dorm room door of an African-American freshman. Now, to me, that's targeted. That was right at her, and that's harassment. So, you know, that's just examples. Again, there, you know, to me, there's a kind of there's a black and there's a white. There's speech. There's conduct. We oppose hate crimes because we think there's a special harm caused there. But there's all sorts of gray areas in the middle, and that's just I think it's just the nature of law that sometimes there, you're going to have to draw fine lines in the middle of what's too much and what isn't. Is it? I think this is going to be our final question, sir. Thank you. My name is Charles Bluestone. Um, I think I slept through most of constitutional law class in, during law school. Well, you weren't um, in my class. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> and I don't always agree with the ACLU. I don't agree with everything that you said today. Um, Twenty years ago, I lived in a small community of London, Ohio, about 25 miles west of here, and I began to hear disturbing rumors of um, activities that teachers were engaged in um, at the local high school where there was forced prayer uh, with students, where uh, students were encouraged to leave their church, the parents' church, and join the church of these teachers, and uh, where there was punishment, uh, including physical punishment of a sort, uh, for the students who didn't engage in, in the prayer-related activities. Uh, I began to take notice of this, and I heard talk of it in town, and I read about it in the local newspaper, and I actually got myself up one day and I went to some of the meetings and listened and nobody was paying attention um, uh, in the legal community. So I began to take affidavits from students and parents, 
public records request from the local school district. And eventually, I wrote a note to the ACLU in Cleveland. Um, at least during law school, I remembered hearing the ACLU in con law class. And to its immense credit, uh, the American Civil Liberty Union came in and took the affidavits that I prepared and filed a lawsuit in the federal court here in Columbus and ended the unconstitutional activities that were going on in that local high school at no expense whatsoever to any of the, of the hundred or so concerned citizens of the community. And, they, and the ACLU stood up for the First Amendment rights of the students and the parents of that community and worked very hard uh, to ensure that, that those First Amendment rights were guaranteed. So I, I never had the chance to meet the president of the American Civil Liberties Union. So 20 years later, let me say thank you to you. Well, <laughs> so let me, let me thank you. We're out of time, so can, do we have, have a, a question what's coming? Uh, would, you, would you talk about the right to privacy and the, go and the freedom to be free from government intrusion into our privacy rights? Okay, uh, well, two things. First of all, thank you for your congratulations. And Christine Link, who's the executive director of the ACLU of Ohio, could you please stand up and accept the congratulations? <laughs> for your work. Um, before answering your question about privacy, I just need to tell you one story. It's just you know, a lovely anecdote with the ACLU of Virginia. Because one of the things, as I was saying, that people sometimes accuse the ACLU of being anti-Christian because we don't believe in government-sponsored religion, which is the point of your question. So there was a high school in Virginia where the, um, the school wanted to have a, a denominational prayer before the football game. And the ACLU of Virginia contacted them and said, you can't do that, violates the First Amendment. And apparently the lawyers told them that they were right and the ACLU would sue them and win attorney's fees and they better not do it. So they didn't do it, but there were some students who were very angry about this. So they decided that they wanted to wear t-shirts at the football game and have an anti-ACLU protest. So the president said, uh, the principal said, no, you can't do that because that's going to be disruptive at the football game. <laughs> said, do you see it coming? <laughs> the ACLU of Virginia wrote to the principal and said, let the kids wear their t-shirts. So, okay, privacy. Um, obviously, there's a much longer answer than we have time for. I wrote a whole book about this and other things. But let me tell you where I connect privacy with all the speech stuff. So after 9-11, when the Patriot Act came down, um, I read a wonderful quote about how the Patriot Act reversed the preconditions of democracy by enabling the government to know everything that we're doing and preventing us from knowing what the government is doing. So to me, that's the essence of the problem of privacy and of free speech. We should have the right to find out more about what the government is doing and to protest if we think they're doing something wrong. And access to government information is one of our major activities these days, Freedom of Information Act. Let's just find out. Let's have them be more transparent. But at the same time, if the government is always watching what we're doing, then we're going to start censoring ourselves and censoring our behavior. And it's going to be, then the government gets too much control, and then we have lost our democracy. So that's my brief answer to what about privacy. We're very concerned. Please join me in thanking for this wonderful speech <laughs> today. So really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's forum. I certainly know that I did. Uh, you can view and share today's forum in all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Let's thank our sponsors, Columbus Business First, Puffin Foundation West, and Taft. <laughs> and partner, American Civil Liberties Union of Ohio. And of course, our speakers, Susan Herman and Colleen Marshall. And thanks to all of you for being here, and we'll look forward to seeing you at CMC next week. <laughs>